Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. Apologies for not being on camera for today's video, but I'm working on a couple of projects at the moment. So I'm doing photography with one of my cameras and got kind of the lighting and everything set up. And my other rig, which I usually use to capture camera feed from another camera, has drivers being changed around and some other bits. There'll be some interesting projects uploaded over the next couple of days, but it does basically mean that I'm not on camera for today's video. But... Let's start things out with AMD, specifically the 5900H, which is ruffle stomping, well, AMD's previous generation processors, but also Intel as well. The 5900H is part of the Cezanne lineup, which will uh, be announced at CES 2021, which of course is going to be taking place in January. And Cezanne's APUs are based on the Zen 3 processor core. The clock frequency of the Geekbench results, which uh, videocards.com have discovered, show us that the CPU is running at a base frequency of just 3.3 GHz, but does turbo up to 4.65 GHz. From what we understand, the TDP of the CPU is 45 watts. Either way, comparing it against the 4900H, its predecessor, which of course used Zen 2, well, there is no comparison. <laughs> Um, in terms of multi-thread, it's 11% faster, whereas single-thread, it's 25%. As for Intel, the 10850H is one of the fastest processors in the Comet Lake lineup and just gets absolutely trounced, demolished, and destroyed by Cezanne. We have 33% slower multi-core result with Intel CPU, and 26% in single core. So basically, Intel are getting destroyed with its Comet Lake processors. It's kind of weird, too, when you think about it from the perspective of time. Just a couple of years ago, AMD just had no real presence in mobile at all. I mean, sure, there were the odd processor, which did okay for them, such as uh, Jaguar, which found a home, of course, in the previous generation consoles and some low... Uh, power devices, but overall, in high-performance laptops, mm -mm, nothing really. But now, it's almost like a one-horse race in so many different areas. But maybe Intel can change that with Rocket Lake. We've seen some interesting performance numbers. I still don't think necessarily it's going to outsell what AMD are offering, but it will probably keep them competitive in gaming and a few other niches. But Alder Lake is shaping up to be really impressive. So there is a new story, actually, thanks to Tim Apisak for this uh, benchmark discovery. I'll link, of course, his uh, Twitter account in the video description. Alder Lake is based on the 10NM process, which means that Intel finally will have clawed, dragged its way away from Papa Skylake and the 14NM process. Now, interestingly, too, this... CPU architecture is going to launch at the end of 2021, at least assuming there's no delays. Which, well, there could be delays, let's just be honest. But this architecture, Alder Lake, is also very different, not just because it's a brand new CPU core, although Rocket Lake is as well, technically, but I mean, you know, in architecturally, it's very different too, because Alder Lake is kind of like a big slash small design. So the small cores are absent of hyper-threading, at least from what we've seen so far. Maybe this will change in the future, but it doesn't seem to be. And the big cores, of course, are still hyper-threading uh, enabled. And there's eight uh, big cores and eight small cores, which means there's 24 threads total. So the system of Sandra League we have here is scoring 996 for single core and 69, nice, 31 for multi-core. Having a look at the um, specifications of the chip, I think it's fair to say that Geekbench is like, ah, what the hell are you doing? What's going on? I don't understand which chip at all. And just basically spitting out anything. Um, a great example of this, for example, is the L2 cache, where it's a times three. I assume the 1.25 megabytes uh, number is correct, and probably the L3 cache of 30 megabytes is also correct. The base frequency, 1.38 gigahertz, I can probably imagine that's right, or 1400 megahertz if you prefer. However, the maximum frequency, I mean, either Intel were really trying hard to finally make the 10 gigahertz dream 
a reality or it's just not being reported correctly at all. My guess is that just playing around with calculator, um, if you take that 17.6 gigahertz figure and then start to divide it by the number of processor cores, that could be one way. Although whether you have to divide it by eight or whether you have to divide it by a higher number, I honestly don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's very unlikely to be 17.6 gigahertz. You'll also notice it does mention DDR4 or DRR4 at the top. From what we understand about memory support of Alder Lake, although it does support DDR5, it can also support DDR4 uh, on the memory controller of the processor, which is much like we saw with Intel's Skylake architecture. Natively, it supported DDR4, but it could also support low power variant of DDR3. And I think technically you could kind of hack it to run regular DDR3, but had to be at certain voltages or something like that. I honestly can't remember now because it's been a long time. I also spent a minute running uh, Geekbench, the same version, by the way, 5.3.1 on my 10900K. And you can see the scores yourself. I ran 1.4 gigahertz for um, all core and 1.6 for a single core. And uh, I scored 446, 3707. I also find it rather interesting how the uh, different um, results, such as, for example, ray tracing did versus Alder Link. 564 and 5253 for a flat 2 gigahertz. This is irrelevant of a single core or multi core. And I also ran at 2.6, where I scored 727 and 6433. Again, uh, I think this is like the absolute limit of what we would expect from this engineering sample. I'm guessing it was closer to around the 2 gigahertz mark, but I added in all of them anyway. There were actually some IPC leaks for this processor, which dated back earlier this year. Um, and I believe it originated on a Chinese website, but it was also posted by a user on Twitter. I think it was Mibwu, I think... Uh, I'll, I'll Google it anyway, but I do remember anyway that uh, the IPC gains were pretty impressive. We're going to be looking at um, Sunny Cove, of course, was an 18% gain. This, by the way, is with the base being Skylake, and then uh, Willow Cove was a 25% gain, again, with the base being Skylake, and then Golden Cove was 1.5, so 50%, and then Ocean Cove was... Well, it was it was like rubbed out, but it looked like it was about one point eight ish. So it's um it's looking to be pretty good for Alder Lake. The only question is how well it will actually perform in reality versus what AMD will have that you know then on the market. Let's finish the video off with NVIDIA, shall we? The RTX 3080 Ti has been further confirmed, as if it wasn't confirmed enough already. At this point, Papa Janssen just needs to appear on a live stream and pull it out of his oven. As well as the RTX 3060 12GB. And this is courtesy of the Euro-Asian Economic Commission, EEC. Um, yeah, Gigabyte basically filed all of this, and although a card being listed here doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become a real product. There are so many confirmations at this point, and you know, I've kind of gone over a few of them already, that we basically know that these cards do exist. And for those who missed out, it's basically the RTX 3090, albeit with 20 gigabytes of memory and a narrower memory bus, but CUDA core count and everything else is basically identical. I'm expecting this to cost 999 US dollars. That's, of course, for the Founders Edition model. So it is considerably cheaper than the RTX 3090 by about 50%, depending, of course, how much you count uh, retailer price gouging at the moment, as some retailers are what is known as taking the piss. But, um, yeah, these cards are basically real. Uh, courtesy, by the way, to videocards.com for that particular nugget of information. And finally, there is a lot of confusion because of NVIDIA's mobile GPUs. So Ampere, of course, is coming to mobile with the RTX 30 series being announced soon, I'm guessing, maybe at CES, pure guess. But um, yeah, so the RTX 3080, 3070, and 3060 are all incoming. 
So it's kind of funny because laptops featuring the mobile variant of the 3080, 70 and 60 are already available for pre-order, starting at 1700 euros. And this is thanks to a uh, laptop manufacturer slash retailer in Netherlands. I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, but Skikik, I'm assuming. I'm probably completely and utterly pronouncing that wrong, but it's S-K-I-K-K. And... Again, what's interesting here is that there is actually a listing for an RTX 3080 Max-Q with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. And we also have other entries too with, for example, the RTX 3070 with 8 gigabytes, again, GDDR6 uh, memory. That's not 6X, that's just R6. We also have some specifications of these GPUs, which has also emerged, courtesy to Notebook Check for these results. And um, yeah, so the RTX 3080 allegedly contains 6,144 CUDA cores, the 3070 features 5120, and finally the RTX 3060 features 3,072. Now, if you're intimately familiar with the RTX 30 for desktop, you'll probably be thinking, hmm, that doesn't sound quite right. And indeed, yeah, you are right. That was a terrible sentence, but I'm rolling with it. So the RTX 3080, going back for the mobile, has RT, uh, sorry, has a 6144 CUDA cores. If you compare this to the desktop variant, that has 8,704. The RTX 3070 for desktop features 5,888, with the alleged specifications of the RTX 3070 Ti featuring 7,424. So basically speaking, the mobile variant of the RTX 3080 is a lot closer to the desktop version of the RTX 3070. With the mobile version of the RTX 3070 featuring 5120 CUDA cores, that's only a few more than the RTX 3060 Ti, which contains 4864 CUDA cores. So basically, yeah, it's essentially, when you're saying the mobile version RTX 3080, it's really, it's closer to the desktop specs, and that's also why we have 16 gigabytes of memory rather than 20, which you would expect if it was using the same core as the RTX 3080 for desktop. If you're not confused enough yet, and I don't blame you, while all of that's interesting, to me, the big story then is that does that mean that desktop versions of these cards will also see higher VRAM um, versions released in the future? We know that the RTX 3080 um, 20 gigabyte model did exist, or at the very least NVIDIA were thinking of releasing it, but obviously that just did not happen. So I do wonder whether we're going to see this situation where NVIDIA are going to maybe slightly change the specs of the RTX 3080, or whether they're just going to let it rock. Again, the 3080 Ti for desktop does feature uh, 20 gigabytes of memory. So yeah, it, it's just kind of puzzling with the whole VRAM situation. Uh, I was also going recently over the RTX 3060, which is going to have different variants as well, um, with cards featuring both 6 and 12 gigabytes of memory. So, long story short, the VRAM situation for NVIDIA is really confusing at the moment. And um, I think it's just a case of um, just needing to wait and see, honestly, because... It's clear that they are, at the very least, considering releasing higher VRAM capacities for desktop. Now, it is possible that the specifications we have here from the laptop manufacturer are incorrect. However, um, Notebook Check are also reporting that we're going to be seeing uh, 16 and 8 gigabyte variants of the mobile version of the RTX 3080. But with all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. If you've enjoyed it, the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.